Welcome to Advantage Radio Ministries here on Lift FM. My name is Greg Hennis, and this is our weekly program in which if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you do understand that God loved each and every one of us so very much that he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross so that you and I could have life and have it more abundantly. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you've been searching and searching and searching, looking for that inner peace, perhaps that inner peace that you're looking for is really the true Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, as a matter of fact, before this program is done, we're going to give you the opportunity to invite Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life. We're going to give you the opportunity to ask him into your heart before this very program is done. Our guest today on the program is Josh Kelly. He is the author of the book entitled Radically Normal. And Josh, thank you for joining us here on Second Chances. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, For those of us that uh, don't know much about you, Josh, uh, give us a little bit of background on where you're from, were you born into a Christian home, and maybe you could even incorporate a little bit of your personal testimony on how you came to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so I grew up in a really good Christian home, had great parents. Um, Maybe we're a little on the legalistic side, but not really, just trying to figure out how to love Jesus and, uh, you know, not to get too caught up in the world. Um, So, you know, great family and all that. Uh, Became a Christian my mom says uh, it was at a puppet show when I was four years old, so I'll, I just leave her on that. But that's kind of my walk for, for, you know, just trying to grow closer and closer to God. And a lot of the kind of the uh, background to the book, Directly Normal, is that, you know, in youth group, there is those kids, you know, that, or sorry, the youth pastor would always talk about, you know, avoiding sin and, and uh, not, uh, not falling off that cliff of complacency or, you know, sleeping with your boyfriend or girlfriend or, you know, all the, all the bad stuff that, uh, that we're told not to do. And I had no problem with that. I didn't do any of those bad things. The problem was there was another cliff I was falling off of, and that's the cliff on the other side of the path of legalism, self-righteousness, of spiritual pride, that um, so much of my identity was caught up in being the best Christian in the youth group. And so this book really is the book I wish I would have had as a kid who genuinely wanted to follow God and love Him, but uh, didn't know how that looked, how I, you know, how radical, how weird I had to be if I had to grow my hair long and start dressing like John the Baptist, if I had to start speaking in spiritual language and start only reading King James Version or all that stuff. And um, so that's kind of the background of the book and, and my life in a, in a very brief nutshell. Now it says here in my notes that you are currently on a year-long cross-country speaking tour along with your uh, wife, uh, Marilyn, and your two daughters. Uh, uh, yep. When did it begin and how long is it uh, going to continue for? Well, we've been on this for about three months. It's going to be a ten-month a year, a ten-month trip all told. And it's kind of funny in that you know here I write this book. It's called Radically Normal, and the the goal is to tell people how that they can be whole hot, wholehearted, radical followers of Jesus in very normal everyday sort of ways. So I write this book telling people that they don't have to uh, uh, sell everything and move to India to become to uh, really serve God. Uh, but then I sell my house and pack up my family and drive around the country for a year. And it, it kind of seems, you know, a lot of people like point that out. It's like, uh, are you kind of contradicting what you're saying? And um, the the reason why this is so uh, this is different than ra- being radical in a bad way is that this trip is driven by joy. It's driven by our desire to. This is something we've wanted to do. And kind of the, the soul of my book is joy. That joy really is the proper motivation for the Christian life. You know, um, discipline, obedience, all those things are vital. But the purpose, the goal. That God set out is joy, and in fact, you know, you talk, talk about Jesus that uh, you know, for the joy set before him, he endured the shame of the cross, and it still joy was that motivation. It was what was moving him, and that's what's supposed to move us as well. And so, if I would have taken this trip because I thought I was a better Christian for uh, living by faith and not exactly knowing what the next step is, uh, that would have been a bad, bad motivation. You know, trying to just be a better Christian or make God like me more. Instead, we're doing this because it's something we just want to do, and it's a, a wonderful opportunity to show the country to our daughters and to be able to serve people as we go along. And it's been, been, been a very interesting event. Now, how does one fund a year-long trip across the country? Uh, you live very cheaply. <laughs> <laughs> we, it, it's been very interesting in that, I mean, to, to give a little bit more of my background, I've been a pastor for 15 years, and um, that's it's something I really enjoyed doing and really enjoyed um, serving God that way. But we had the church that I was at, unfortunately, uh, 
we it just shrunk down to the place where we were no longer able to keep it going. It was no longer sustainable, and we were at the place where we had to decide: are we just going to let the bank come in and take the property, or are we going to church to close this church in a manner that honors God and really serves the people well? And that's that's a tough thing to do because we live in a culture that success is defined by having a bigger and bigger church and doing more and more, and God just didn't do it that way. And so with all that happening, we kind of were left at the end. The, the, the uh, leadership of the church decided to give me a little bit of a severance package, which is pretty common for pastors because we don't get uh, to pay into unemployment. And so we took that, sold the house, had a little bit of proceeds from the house, and are just, again, living very cheaply as we do this. Um, so it's, it's, it's uh, part, you know, a lot of, lot of uh, trust here in, in this whole process. Would you say, uh, not that we want to spend the whole uh, time talking about this trip, but it's very intriguing, do you yeah. expect that uh, during the the conclusion of this trip that the Lord is probably going to point you in a direction of, of where you're going to uh, be uh, following this trip? I, I'm really hoping so, and, and I think so. He, God's never failed me. He's taken uh, us on some interesting paths, done things a little different than we might think, but He's never, ever failed us. So even though at this point I don't have a super clear picture of what's next, I, I know that, that God will make that clear when the time comes. For us now, the, uh, the real emphasis has been um, being able to serve people, sometimes speaking at churches with you know, a lot of people, sometimes talking to some individuals. Just a couple weeks ago, I was uh, in Texas and just ended up striking a conversation with a young man at a missionary organization and just saw how tortured he was because he just felt like he wasn't good enough of a Christian for God. He was trying so hard to do all the right stuff and hear God and and make sure that he's obedient, and he was so afraid that uh, God was not pleased with him because he just wasn't doing, you know, what if he was missing something? And so I had this opportunity to talk to him and really help him understand God's love for him and that God's crazy about him and that, that he can find joy in everyday things. And so it's been, it's been quite an interesting journey. Have you made it uh, to the East Coast yet? Uh, we are making our way there. Uh, so we came down the West Coast and are heading down to the, to the South, uh, going to be in Florida for February, because uh, that sounds like a better idea than being in uh, Seattle during February. It sure does. <laughs> and then we're going to start heading up the East Coast. Um, so you're, you're in New Jersey, correct? Correct. So I think that's going to be right around uh, mid-May that we're going to be there. And so hopefully I'll be able to find some churches to speak at there, or groups to be able to minister to, and as well just, again, see the area and show, show it off to our daughters. That's wonderful. Now, uh, in the midst of, of this, uh, how did the book come to be? Well, the book was something that I just was kind of in my heart for a long time, and these uh, general loose ideas on trying to explain what the Christian life should look like. That it, uh, I'm really trying to help people avoid both uh, complacent Christianity and also obsessive Christianity. That you don't have to be like, um, you know, again, sell everything and move to India in order to follow Jesus, but that also just serving Jesus or just going to church and packing God into the smallest corner of your life, that that's not... That's not a very good, joy-fulfilled life either. And so it's kind of these a lot of loose ideas that kind of came together as I started working on the book, and uh, especially when I started preaching through these topics. And it's been something where I've really seen how much it's freed a lot of Christians, because so many Christians live underneath this guilt of feeling like they're, they're never doing enough for God. If, if they're just to do a little more, a little more, God would be happier with them. And... Uh, that they're just second-class citizens in the kingdom of God because they're not pastors, because they're not Billy Graham. And so I've just watched first through the sermons and through uh, emails I've gotten and through conversations, really is able to set people free from a lot of that guilt that I think is misplaced. We are visiting with Josh Kelly, the author of the book entitled Radically Normal. Certainly, Josh, if you were talking about the title Radically Normal, I don't think in in many people's mind this year-long cross-country tour would have come up as radically normal, but uh, it is uh, very interesting, and, and just like the book. Now, how much would you say the book itself comes out of your own experience as far as being raised in a legalistic home? It really is. Um, it's a book that I wish I had as a kid, so it really does reflect that. Um, I, again, this group, the book is designed to speak to two groups of people. Christians who are either living complacently or always feeling under guilt because they just don't feel like they're doing enough, but also Christians who feel like they're God's gift to the church, that uh, they're doing all the right things, they're pretty smart, and they're pretty righteous. I was in that latter category. I'm a a little ashamed to admit that that's how I felt, but it basically was. And so this is the book, you know, coming from my background, was 
to speak to that, as well as being a pastor and talking to other people about their guilt and their, their fears, um, to kind of speak to that as well. Our guest is Josh Kelly. The book is entitled Radically Normal. Josh, if uh, someone would like to learn more about uh, you, uh, your work, the book, things of that nature, is there a website that one could visit and uh, best places to pick up the book? Yeah, absolutely. So my website is radicallynormal.com. Again, radicallynormal.com. And there they can find out a little bit more about me. And uh, if they're interested in having me speak, there's, there's some information there as well. Um, information on doing small groups from the book. It's got a lot. Of, it, this book was driven by personal experiences and by stories. I've learned, you know, Jesus knew what he was doing when he told lots of stories. It, it's much more effective. And so I try to tell a lot of stories. And so it becomes a very readable book and a book that can really help people um, engage with it quickly and then hopefully help them. Um, in terms of purchasing the book, you know, it's available at Amazon or Barnes & Noble, a lot of Christian bookstores carrying it. I know Lifeway carries it. So, uh, yeah, it, it should be available in mo- most, uh, most menus. You ask in the book uh, whether radically normal Christians can be radically obedient without being obsessive. So what's the right. answer? What's the answer? Well, that's, that's really the goal of the book, is to show people how to be radically devoted to God in everyday ways, in ways that are very normal, you know, that uh, you don't have to feel bad for not being a missionary uh, unless you really know that God has called you to be a missionary, that, that God really wants uh, a lot of uh, uh, baristas and people working at Home Depot and caring for kids and all of that are great ways to, to fully honor God in their daily lives. They don't need to, to do the radical stuff. Sometimes just day-to-day life is, is quite enough, and you can honor God in that. It doesn't take long uh, when you first uh, make your commitment in your life to be a Christian. You'll, you'll come across a passage of Scripture that says that uh, Christians are peculiar people, and uh, you even have a chapter in the book with uh, a title such as that, uh, Why Are Christians So Weird? And yep. Is It Okay to Be Normal? Why do you think that most people see Christians as weird? Is it because the Bible says that we are a peculiar people? Well, when we, it talks about their uh, being a peculiar people, God, you know, really talking especially about the Jewish people and how they're called to be set apart. And when you think about the Jewish history, they were called to be set apart, not so that they could uh, be aloof and separate from everyone else, but so that they could be holy and be a light into the, to the nation. I mean, God said to, uh, to Abraham, I will bless you so that you can be a, a blessing and that the nations will be blessed through you. So... There was a very important stage in uh, in Israel when they had to be look very very different from the world from the world around them in order to not to get um, acclimated into not to be um, assimilated by the pagan culture, and so that was vital. Uh, but what's ended up happening today is that you know with the with the coming of the church, we're now called to be in the world but not of the world, and that means that we're going to be alike like them in some ways but very different in, in other ways. And one of the key callings, I hope, of the book is that people learn there's good ways to be different from the world and there's, good, and there's bad ways to be different from the world. The good ways to be different from the world are things like being filled with the fruit of the Spirit. It's, it's trusting God. It's if you're at work and the pink slips start flying, everyone else is freaking out because they might lose their job, and you're calm. And you're saying, you know, yeah, I'm a little worried. I, I don't know what's going to happen, but I know God's going to take care of me. He's never failed me. And everyone's looking at you saying, that's weird. Why, why are you not freaking out? That, that's a good way to be weird. Not necessarily a good way to be weird is if every time someone comes to your cubicle, you hand them a fistful of tracks, and you only talk to them in spiritual languages, and, and you, they can't feel like they can't talk to you about football or daily life. So it's choosing the right ways to be weird instead of the weird, weird, weird ways to be weird. Hmm. A lot of Christians, I think, focus on more the weird stuff, the wearing the, the bumper, the, having the Christian bumper stickers and wearing all the T-shirts, because um, it's frankly easier to just look strange than it is to be different from the inside. Mm. What's the balance between holding to a biblically-based moral standard and uh, trying to be relevant in today's uh, very heavily unbelieving world? You know, that really means that you have to struggle through and understand what are the right ways to be different, and not just pay attention to outward appearances. You know, the, the legalism that uh, Jesus had to deal with with the Pharisees had so much to do with the outward appearances that on the outside, the Pharisees really looked perfect. On the inside, their hearts were, were, were uh, not, not in good shape. And so in the same way as Christians, to find ways that we can be different, you know, in any given situation, we can look at something and usually have a good sense of 
whether or not we can honor God by doing that. There's a lot of things that, that Christians can legitimately disagree on, you know, on what type of dress or what kind of music or, or um, you know, what kind of, of sports you're going to watch. You know, Christians can just disagree about that or, or what kind of worship you're going to sing. And rather than getting caught up in, in those things, um, just get caught up into the fruit of the Spirit. I think that those things, love, joy, peace, and patience, and all those are some of the best things to gauge our lives by. Be different in those things rather than worrying about, you know, again, the way we look. What do you mean by the comment that God shouldn't be our only happiness? You know, that's kind of a, I, I like kind of getting some of those uh, uh, inflammatory statements in there. But when I say that uh, God shouldn't be our only happiness, I don't say that because He isn't able to be our only happiness, but that He doesn't want us to. He doesn't want to be. That He's filled this world with many good and, and good and, and wonderful gifts that He wants us to take the light in. Scripture commands us to delight in the things of this earth all over the place, you know, to delight in the wife of your youth and enjoy a meal with good friends, to celebrate, to have this, the, all these celebrations that the Bible is filled with. And um, so a lot of Christians feel like if they're in doing something that isn't expressly spiritual, like praying or reading the Bible, uh, the, 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 they're not quite being spiritual enough. So one of the running illustrations I use in the book, because I talk about football, I'm, a, I'm from Seattle, I'm a little bit of a Seahawks fan, and um, I use that example as saying, you know, watching a football game is not necessarily a better thing than praying. There's a time to watch a football game, there's a time to pray. But if you're watching a football game, you don't necessarily need to feel guilty for not praying unless you haven't prayed at all that week. To so find these, the right times and places and enjoy the good things that God's given us. When I was talking about some of these early uh, ideas to another pastor in my hometown, that's just something that really struck him. He just was silent for a moment and said, you know, so you, you're saying I don't have to feel guilty for watching a football game. Well, no, I don't think you, you do. Now, if you're skipping church every Sunday to watch a football game, we, we probably have a, there, there's, there's a problem going on. But to, to just be able to enjoy the right thing, uh, enjoy God's earthly gifts in the right times, in the right proportions. And there's a real wonderful benefit if you can start to see that God invites us to enjoy the things he's created. When that happens, then you feel like you can, can invite God into your earthly celebrations. If you feel like you can invite Jesus to the football game and enjoy it with him and be cheering over a touchdown and then thanking Jesus for just being able to enjoy the sport, you're not going to be doing the, the dumb, destructive stuff that a lot of people do at football games. If, on the other hand, you, you're feeling guilty for being at the football game anyways, you're going to be more inclined to do the stuff that you shouldn't do. Mm. We're visiting with Josh Kelly, the author of Radically Normal. And, uh, Josh, if someone's uh, just tuned in here in the last couple of minutes and missed the website that you put out, and uh, best place to pick up a copy of your book, could you pass that along once again? Yeah, absolutely. Any uh, a lot of Christian bookstores carry it, or Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, Christian book distributors. Um, and if people want to know more about me, they can go to uh, radicallynormal.com. That's the best place to get more information. You can even read the first chapter of the book. You say that you wished people knew that God's commands bring joy. How do yep. we view them? How do we view them? We, we tend to view God's commands as a bunch of things He tells us not to do so that we don't have fun. Um, instead, what I've really learned is that, is that God knows how we're made and how we tick and how we're designed. And so here's what's going to destroy you. Here's what's going to hurt you and your relationship with others. Don't do them. Let's call them sin. And if we can view sin as that which destroys us rather than things we don't get to do, then I think it can really change our perspective. I, I spend a a good chapter in the book focusing on that, because I just want to get people to really believe at a gut level that obedience brings joy, that following God's commands will make life more joyful, not necessarily easier, not necessarily easier, but more enjoyable, and uh, that, that in the end we'll be glad for when we obey and we'll regret when we did not. You use the term safe practices. Uh, what do you mean by safe practices and... What are some of them? Well, with that, that's a, there's a chapter that I devote to money, because money is one of the most complicated things that we have to deal with as Christians. And it's easy to go to, to extremes. On one hand, uh, a lot of Christians basically, are, uh, basically view their life as being all about money. They, do what it, they uh, spend it, they get, spend their life trying to get as much of it as they can, and they maybe give little bits and pieces to other people, but it's basically about themselves. On the other hand, then, some Christians take a more obsessive route 
where they feel like um, the holiest people are the ones who give away everything they have, who live on as little as possible. And that's, the Bible doesn't teach either of those. The, the Bible teaches that we're blessed to be a blessing, that God gives us, and that we get to take what He's given us and give to others and enjoy it in the process. And so I really try to say, here's how you can take what God's blessed you with and enjoy it properly without it putting its hold on you. Because if you don't treat money right, if you just hang on to it, it ends up putting its grips on you and, and really bringing less joy. I think we all know that. You know, we just came through Christmas time and people began their credit card bills soon. And, you know, it seemed like it's fun to give super extravagant gifts that you couldn't afford, but the fun's going to run out pretty soon here. And so I talk about things like generosity, um, contentment. Contentment is one of the most important ways we can stay safe from uh, the lure of money, that when we're content with what we have, whatever we have, then we're in a better place to be able to, to treat money properly. In the book, you provide a definition of the word worldliness. Uh, tell us what you say about it. Yeah, so the word world, uh, the Greek word is cosmos. It's a little confusing because the Bible itself, um, the Bible itself uses that one word in many different ways, just as we might use the English word, say, um, run, many different ways. It can mean to operate something. It can mean to jog. It can mean a place you keep your chickens. In the same way, cosmos can have a bunch of different meanings. One sense of, co- of cosmos is that which God has created, this good. Uh, so it says that God so loved the world, the cosmos that gave his only son. It's good for us to be able to enjoy this world, that, the world in that sense. That's a good thing. But then also cosmos can mean the world system that is opposed to God. So it's where it says that, you know, do not love the world or anything that's in the world. So we need to understand that if there's things from the world that are pulling our hearts and our allegiance away from our Savior. Those, that's, the bad, that's the world in the bad sense. So the real trick and the, the, the uh, thing that we have to be careful as Christians is to understand which world is it, what, what are the things that are earthly, that are the world that are good to enjoy, what are the things that are worldly, that are t- pulling us away from God, that to love it is to be pulled away from God. And that's, I spent a couple chapters talking about that because it's so vital. I think a lot of Christians either A, uh, go into legalism, where they make all sorts of rules and avoid all sorts of things that they even could, uh, should enjoy. I mean, you go back to the uh, the Middle Ages, or not Middle Ages, yeah, even beginning early church history. Um, a lot of the uh, early church fathers thought that the holiest marriage is the ones where the uh, husband and wife weren't intimate at all, because, you know, somehow sex couldn't be quite holy. That's kind of a real obsessive legalistic view. But then, in my day especially, in the generation, in my generation, the generations after mine, uh, they're so busy avoiding legalism that they're falling headlong into worldliness and, uh, you know, really pursuing a lot of stuff they shouldn't. Mm. What is the single greatest thing that one can learn from suffering? You know, I can't say what the single greatest thing they can learn from suffering is. I, I spent a lot of time on suffering since, you know, the, I spent, spent a chapter on because the book is about joy, and I have to ask, well, if the purpose of the motivation for the Christian life is joy, what about when things are bad, when we're not enjoying it? So I, I don't, in the book, try to say, this is why bad things happen. That's, you know, there's a lot of good books that talk about that. But what mine does is say, when bad things are happening, what can we learn from it? What now? How can God bring us greater joy? And each time the situation may be different, but sometimes there's, there's lessons that God would teach us. There's uh, ways that we can serve others that other people can't. Someone who's gone through a tragedy will be able to serve people that I can't, who hasn't gone through that tragedy. So the perspective I really want the reader to take away from is when suffering happens, rather than asking why me, say, okay, God, what now? How can you take this and use this for my joy in the, eventually? The, the, the passage in Romans 8.28 that says, God works all things for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purposes. The point of that chapter, and sorry, that, uh, that verse, the, the, oh, from there the passage goes on to say that God, those God foreknew, He predestined, those He predestined, He called and justified and uh, will glorify, I think, is something like that. The point of that passage is not so that Christians can argue about whether we have free will or we're predestined. That's not the point. The point is, God's saying, I know the plans that I have for you. I know how your story ends, and it's not a tragedy. Your story has a happy ending. So even though there may be a great amount of suffering that you go through in the process, at the end of the story, when the curtain closes, it is a joyful story. And so, you know, where I stand, I, I, I hate suffering. I, I don't like it at all. I hate it so much that I, I don't want to waste any of it. So if God is able to take something as trivial as a stubbed toe in the middle of the night and take that to teach me patience, 
to teach me long suffering and then bring me more joy through that, then I'll take it. That's what I want. Of course, uh, the number one goal, uh, all of us, is to have our lives in such a way where when the day comes that uh, God comes back to claim claim us, that uh, we're right with Him. And a lot of right. people out there would just love to Love to have that opportunity. Maybe, maybe they're in a place right now where they know they're they're not living right. Maybe they're in a place where they just know that they need to make that commitment to make things right, and they just need the opportunity. Uh, Josh, would you lead those listeners that are ready to accept Jesus into their life the opportunity? Would you give them the opportunity? You know, yeah, absolutely. I, I would say that it begins with submission. That this is recognizing that your life is about God; it's not about you, and that what he, when He's at the center. When he's the one who's calling the shots, that's when you finally find what you're made for, what you're designed for. And so becoming a Christian begins with simply saying, God, you're in charge. I've messed this up. Please forgive me. Thank you for forgiving me and for your love and help me to follow you. And that's, that is the group puts you on the greatest adventure you could, you could ever go on. This life no longer is about just what happens here on earth, but it's about amazing things about knowing God better, about serving others more, finding out who God really made you to be um, in ways that the world can never teach you. Our guest on Second Chances has been Josh Kelly. He is the author of the book entitled Radically Normal. Josh, uh, one final time, if you would be willing to uh, pass along information on how one could obtain a copy of your book and a website to visit. Yeah, absolutely. Radicallynormal.com is my website, and uh, the book can be purchased on Amazon or Barnes & Noble or any of those, those regular websites. Okay, well, we want to thank you for being a guest, and uh, we uh, uh, thank you very much for taking time out of our your schedule today. Well, thank you very much. I sure enjoyed being with you. We enjoyed it, too. Our guest has been Josh Kelly. Tune in next week for more Second Chances right here from Advantage Radio Ministries here on Lift FM.